Hi folks, Captain Rutledge here once again with another video commentary. This time we'll be looking at Season 4 and one of its most popular episodes, the Top 10 Masterpiece Series. This episode originally aired in May of 2021, and I hope you all enjoy it. So, on with the spin! I'll just say right now that Season 4 was probably one of my favorite seasons of This Is Public Broadcasting to, to produce. Also, we had a new intro for this season where it's sort of me watching PBS down through the ages wearing the uh, stereotypical clothing like <laughs> you see right there. And here I am in black tie to celebrate Masterpiece on PBS. I sort of planned this episode to be in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of Masterpiece on PBS. And to my complete surprise, it has become one of the most viewed episodes of Season 4 of This Is Public Broadcasting, and I think it only ranks behind my Worst Arthur Episodes list as one of the most viewed episodes. Anyhow, the start of this episode, I go in-depth into the history of Masterpiece on PBS, taking most of my information from David Stewart's The PBS Companion. Like most origins of shows, it, the production does not go very smoothly, to say the least. However, they did manage to find their own staying power on WGBH Boston, despite whatever WNET New York would have to say about it. And they're still running today. So that must say something. And of course, here we have Alistair Cook doing an introduction of Poldark. Anyhow, when compiling this top 10 list, I decided to go from my uh, personal preference of what shows I enjoyed on Masterpiece and Masterpiece Mystery, along with other top 10 lists on the internet. I took very heavy influence from one of the original top tens that aired during Masterpieces, I think it was the 30th anniversary, and I went from there. Some of these I'm very familiar with, some of these shows I have not watched enough of, but I feel that they do have a great bit of staying power when it comes to the world of public television. And the opening segment for each of these top ten entries comes from, I believe, the 1990s intro to Masterpiece Theater, which shows all of the other great shows that, like Upstairs, Downstairs, there's Jewel in the Crown, I believe, and so on and so forth. But number ten, we have The Jewel in the Crown, based off the Raj Quartet by Paul Scott. Now, I... Never really watched all episodes of Jewel in the Crown. I just went through a few episodes in preparation for this list. I knew it was very popular, so I felt I kind of had to include it. And how it portrayed some of the um, hypocrisies and uh, class struggles during the transitional period of British rule in India to self-rule. I could see this series picking up and following in recent years, however, it might not be for all viewers due to certain scenes of violence, nudity, and often uh, sexual assault, which may be disturbing for a few viewers. One of the ways I decided to add a little pizzazz into this top ten list would be for each series that I would do a costume change. This particular one was a seersucker suit to fit in with the Indian subclimate and waving my straw hat as a bit of a fan. Again, all of these clothes that I am wearing were part of my wardrobe at the time, and uh, I do wear them on occasion. Anyhow, we see Merrick here, who is probably one of the more principal characters of the rotating cast in Jewel in the Crown. He's a, he's a tough character to like, to say the least. However, you can understand his motives and his actions based off where he came from and what he aspires to be. Essentially, he's a very human character. However, the way he acts towards others is what makes him a very despicable person. But the cinematography of the series is excellent for the time that it was made. So if you really want to get into Indian history in the 20th century, I do recommend 
watching A Jewel in the Crown. As much as you can, some parts are a bit rough, but once you get through it, you'll feel a lot better for watching it. Maybe I ought to watch a bit of more of it as well. And for India's tomorrow. Yeah, moving on to the number nine spot, we come along to Inspector Morse. Endeavor Morse, one of the most popular modern detective series on Masterpiece. I've never really watched the original Inspector Morse series. This is... The particular scenes that I'm using for the top ten list come from the first episode, The Dead of Jericho. It is the episode where Inspector Morse and Sergeant Lewis meet for the first time, and how they sort of mesh together as a crime-solving unit. My outfit in this bit is my favorite gray suit with a regular tie, sort of similar to what Sergeant Lewis would have worn on a daily basis. On the subject, there were a number of spin-offs to Inspector Morse that I am more familiar with, such as Inspector Lewis, where Sergeant Lewis gets upgraded to the rank of Inspector and solves crimes, as well as the prequel series Endeavor, which focuses on Inspector Morse as a young detective. A lot of critics have cited Inspector Morse as being one of the best British crime dramas in a long time, and I can kind of see the appeal. Inspector Morse in the series is a very relatable person, a very human, fallible detective who often gets things wrong but does his best to hunt down his man with the help of Sergeant Lewis. Another good aspect of the series was the class differences between both Morse and Lewis, uh, Morse being more upper class while Lewis is a working man and a family man. But both of them work together, and there is a very great on-screen chemistry between both John Thaw and Kevin Watley as the characters of Morse and Lewis. It could be worth a watch. Yeah. And on number eight, we come along to I, Claudius. This is another one that I'm not very familiar with, but I did watch a few episodes in preparation for the list again. It's a... Uh, essentially the retelling of Roman history from the rise of the Roman Empire under Caesar Augustus until the eventual uh, death of Claudius at the hands of his mad stepson who would become the Emperor Nero. And if you know Roman history, there is chock full of sex, violence, and all sorts of other graphic imagery. And here we have my version of a Roman tunic that I made myself using part of an old bed sheet. It's not something that I wear on a regular basis, but if you remember watching my Time Warp Trio video, you'll see that I donned it once again when I came back from accidentally causing Vercingetorix to lose against Julius Caesar in battle. Time travel, you can't beat it. It is absolutely amazing, all of the amazing dramatic actors and royalty of British stage that they got together to create this story, originally told by Robert Graves. I doubt that there will be another star-studded cast like it ever again, but in the off chance, it might work. But the makeup, again, it can be a little distracting. But it was the 70s and 80s, so you could kind of give it leeway. Anyhow, moving on to number seven, we come along to Pride and Prejudice, the one that everyone goes gaga for, and here I am in my Regency attire, or as good as a Regency attire as I had at the time. I actually now have a proper tailcoat and trousers to wear for Regency, that, along with the boots as well, but back then I just had the knee breeches, the waistcoat, and the coat that I was wearing was a double-breasted palato. But anyways, on to Pride and Prejudice. A lot of people cite this as the definitive adaptation of Jane Austen's work. Some people prefer the 2000s version, but this it more captures the feel of the Regency era. All the actors feel as if they did just step out of a time machine directed straight from 1810. And it's a very nice Sunday watch, to say the least. As for my relation to the works of Jane Austen, my best introduction to them was through Wishbone, to say, to say funny enough. But the only full adaptation that I've watched all the way through was Emma Thompson's version of Sense and Sensibility. 
which I happen to still have on my uh, video shelf. Yes, I still have a video shelf. <laughs> but I hope someday that if I have a few Sunday afternoons free, then I'll give this series a good watch through. And here we come up to sexy Mr. Darcy. Stupid sexy Darcy. And what, um, in this scene from Disney's uh, Ichabod and Mr. Toad that really fit in with the whole female swooning aspect. I imagine that Colin Firth still receives work just because of his role in this amazing adaptation of Sense and Sensibility. If you will thank me, let it be for yourself alone. But number six that we come on to is, of course, Agatha Christie's... Number six. Oh! Oh! <laughs> I only just realized the mistake with the number ten there. But anyways, Agatha Christie's Poirot. <laughs> I must apologize for that. Anyhow, Poirot. I started watching Poirot when I was a teenager, and it really grew on me how Poirot uses psychology to deduce criminals like that. And here I am, dressed in a style similar to Captain Arthur Hastings, Poirot's uh, best friend and business partner. In fact, I think I got that tweed overcoat from Etsy, and I still have it today, and I still wear it, probably inspired by the coat that Hugh Fraser wore during his time as Captain Hastings. Speaking of which, here's Captain Hastings right now. Anyhow, later on, I started watching the original 1990s episodes of Poirot on PBS when they were brought in by American Public Television, and they're a great Sunday watch, to say the least. Very enthralling, excellent short mysteries, and even the movies like Murder on the Orient Express or Murder in Mesopotamia are absolute gems of mystery programming. Not that uh, any other ones fail in comparison, but David Suchet effectively encapsulated the character of Hercule Poirot, and all the other actors and writers did their best to not undersell Poirot's side characters like Hastings, Miss Lemon, or Inspector Jap. They, without them, Poirot would never be able to solve a single case, to say the least. And what do you know, I got the number correct for this one. Of course, this is a double for Poldark, the 1970s version and the 2010s. And I'm dressed up as best as I can for 1790s in a dark coat and brown waistcoat. I think it works pretty well for the period. Anyhow, the 1970s Poirot I watched after watching the first season of the original Poirot. They're both excellent series. The... 1970s Poirot had the benefit of, of course, the author uh, Winston Graham present to, to consult on the stories for the screenplays on television. In fact, Winston Graham had to write another three novels to wrap up the original plot that he put together in the first four Poldark novels. And then came the few sequel novels that the BBC attempted to adapt for television, but nothing came of it. As for the new series, they effectively adopted the first seven Poldark novels, which were all set in sequence, as well as an original fifth season that tried to wrap up everything between Ross and George Warlagen and everybody else in the vicinity of Cornwall. As for the definitive actor to portray Ross Poldark, Robin Ellis is more refined, he seems more like a former gentleman, while Aidan Turner is more rough around the edges and slightly more genuine in his performance. It just depends on what kind of character you want to watch, whether you want the more dashing and suave or the more rough and tumble. It's up to you. But I've seen the new series all the way through, I have yet to watch the original series a bit more. It's up to you to choose which one is a definitive one for you. That's up to the viewer to decide. But no matter which adaptation you choose, you're in store for yet another masterpiece. What time is it? Past midnight. Uh, too early for sleep. I'll go and play the tables a while. But number four, we come to The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Jeremy Brett. This is the original 
adaptation of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's work that I ever watched. It was a pledge drive and they were showing the very first episode of Scandal in Bohemia on a local television station. I watched it all the way through. I was enthralled. I became encapsulated by the world of Sherlock Holmes and here I am dressed like Jeremy Brett's Holmes right now with the cravat and long tail coat and sponge bag trousers. In fact, I originally wore that type of cravat as the character of the captain based off of Jeremy Brett's portrayal as Sherlock Holmes. And we bring up Holmes' drug use, which brings to a funny moment where that was never in the script where I lay aside the pipe. I get a lot of those moments that are completely unscripted in these episodes. Anyhow, Jeremy Brett, still in my mind, is the definitive Sherlock Holmes. Even though he never got to portray every story, he did his best, even when he was in really poor health. For the first few seasons, he started suffering from bipolar disorder, which made him really tough to work with. And later on, he started taking lithium, which caused him to gain weight. That really didn't help out very much. Even later on, he started having a weak heart because he smoked like an old engine. But, for all of his pains, he is the definitive Sherlock Holmes. And then we get to this bit where we talk about BBC's Sherlock. I watched every episode. I even saw the final season on PBS. And it's very good. It's very well made. A few of the early episodes are well written. But as the show went on, it kind of became its own worst enemy. Stephen Moffat and Mark Gaddis are very talented actors, but trying to one-up for every subsequent series really did not work out for Sherlock as a whole. It's still amazing to watch a modern take on an old classic. Part of me wonders what a modern take on Poirot would be like, but I think I'll have to settle for David Suchet at the moment. Anyhow, number three, we come to Downton Abbey! <laughs> I originally watched Downton Abbey on and off during its original airing on PBS, and I watched a few episodes when they had uh, fundraisers for public television, these long weekend marathons, etc. But then, during the summer of 2019, I watched the entire series from episode to episode in preparation for the movie that came out that September, and I really enjoyed it. To say the least, it was excellent. And here I am in my favorite gray suit again with the waistcoat intact, unlike for when I was wearing it as Sergeant Lewis. I don't go too deep into Downton Abbey in this particular episode because I made a whole episode about Downton Abbey back in Series 3 in preparation for the upcoming feature film. And now that we had another feature film that came out this summer, I'd say that it wrapped things up pretty well, and I'd be open for a few more adaptations of Downton Abbey in the big screen or on television, whichever it may come. Then for number two, I, it might be a crime to place it above Downton Abbey, but I had to do it because it is upstairs, downstairs, one of the most influential British dramas of all time. If not for upstairs, downstairs, we wouldn't have Downton Abbey, to say the least. I originally started watching Upstairs Downstairs when I had my BritBox subscription, however, nowadays BritBox, it doesn't carry as many BBC and ITV programs as it used to, and I kind of turned off it. But from what I've seen of Upstairs Downstairs, it is an excellent series, and definitely the spawning moment for Downton Abbey to come. And here I am wearing a sort of a valet costume. And the shame about some of these episodes that once aired on PBS is that they edited out quite a bit, including the scene where the footman starts a relationship with the German count who is visiting. They go into more detail in the PBS companion about Upstairs Downstairs and how it really was the big hit that cemented Masterpiece as the mainstay of public television it is today. One funny anecdote that was in the PBS Companion about Upstairs Downstairs was about the creator Jean Marsh. She played the character of Rose in the series, 
and a horticulturalist eventually approached her about about naming a rose after her. And um, a while later, she looked that up in a flower catalog, and the brief description of the Jean Marsh rose said, not good in beds, better up against the wall. You can imagine how, how that might have made her feel, to say the least. It's just small little anecdotes in this book that make it worth reading, such as when Jean Marsh was presented to Princess Margaret, and the man attending the princess presented Jean Marsh as the leading lady in Upstairs, Downstairs. And Princess Margaret says, Oh, I'm afraid I missed that. And the man described the series in more detail, but Princess Margaret didn't understand. She said, Oh, I must have been away. And Jean Marsh eventually blurted out, Away? For five years? I just felt like ending this bit with Sesame Street's Upstairs, Downstairs. It, I just felt it at the moment. But anyways, we came on to the honorable mentions. Sharp, I really want to do a small tidbit about a single episode of Sharp eventually in the future. Victoria, I watched it all the way through. It was absolutely wonderful. A great look at the life of one of Britain's most famous queens, Agatha Christie's Marple, similar to Poirot. And I kind of feel guilty about not including it on the list proper. Then All Creatures Great and Small is probably going to be Masterpiece's next great hit. And now we come to number one, which I had to make Jeeves and Worcester. I could not do any other. I would not allow it. Because Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry absolutely encapsulate these timeless characters. I originally started watching Jeeves and Worcester when I was in my first year at university, and I loved it. I watched the whole series through, I started reading the original stories by P.G. Woodhouse. I adored it. It was funny, it was classy, it was everything. Which is sort of why I had to include it at the top of the list. Not to mention a tiny bit of commentary that I don't know if it was either intentional or unintentional within P.G. Woodhouse's work. You see, Bertie Wooster and all of his friends are absolute incompetence. They can't do anything right. They get into these schemes that never work. It is up to the lower class, like Jeeves, to help pull them out of their accidents without very any without any reward whatsoever to their endeavors. You know, Downton Abbey and Upstairs Downstairs, they kind of had similar, but it's too dramatic. It's not satirical enough, like with Jeeves and Worcester. If you folks want to learn more about Jeeves and Worcester for yourselves, I'm pretty sure there are still a few episodes of it still on YouTube for you to check out Fall in Love with the Series like I did. If it's not for you, hey, I get it. But this is more of a personal number one for me. Then there's not to mention the title sequence. I don't know what it is about a lot of these British dramas, but they have excellent title sequences. Jeeves and Worcester has the classic art modern approach and the jazz music. Then Poirot has a smooth saxophone and mysterious outlines. It is an absolute joy to watch some of these masterpiece show intros. Maybe I ought to do a top ten about them in the future. I don't know. Anyhow, this is wrapping up the video, and here I am back in my favorite black tie ensemble with my captain's jacket over top. About ready to toast to another 50 years of masterpiece. And don't worry, people, that's mineral water. And we're coming up to the part in every episode where we look at a public television member station. In this case, this episode looks at WHYY in Philadelphia. And I figure we might just fast forward through this bit. Da 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 da. Forwards, 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 and here we go. Back to me. In summary, I had a fun time making this top 10 list of Masterpiece episodes. It was fun to make, it was fun to watch, it was fun to perform. It was just a whole barrel of monkeys. And recent days, I'm surprised about how many people come and watch this video. I figure most people are into my PBS Kids-related content, but 
surprises happen on YouTube. Some of them pleasant, some of them not so much, but here we all are. But thank you for watching another of these commentaries. I hope you tune in for the final one, which will be covering an episode from Season 5 to round it all out. And I hope you stay tuned for Season 6 of This Is Public Broadcasting. In the meantime, I'm Captain Rutledge. Good day.